Hey, I've been having a ton of fun fixing up some of these old guitars that I've picked up over the years that I never got around to fixing up. And so up today is one of my favorites. It's a Fujigen replica of a Gibson Les Paul. Fujigen is the Japanese factory that made a lot of these sort of um, imitation guitars back in the day. And this guitar is famous because it was often called a lawsuit Les Paul um, because Gibson actually sued this factory over making these, <laughs> these replicas uh, of some other guitars too. Um, I don't know too much about that. You can go look it up if you're interested in it, but I, I love the lawsuit guitars. I think they're cool. Like I, a lot of us uh, of a certain age, that was these are the guitars that we learned on. And then I was recently at like a sort of like a yard sale and I found this guitar in this original hard shell case with no pickups um, and you know missing some other parts for 20 bucks and so i grabbed it and i'm gonna see if i can make a playing uh lawsuit les paul out of it let's see how bad it is this type of work often starts with just basic deconstructing which is a lot of fun and i put all the parts in a parts bin i decided to start with the neck which looked to be in pretty good shape except for obviously some of this binding is is peeling off and my first instinct was to just pull all the binding off and rebind it, but then I decided I wanted to try and repair it and patch it and leave it as much of it as original as possible. Um, so I went through, there's basically two spots that I just cleaned up and made two large spots that I went into my binding uh, collection and just sort of squared it off and glued it on and then, you know, fit it. And obviously the color doesn't match perfectly because of the 50 year <laughs> difference in age between the old and the new, but um, I thought it blended okay. Um, and I think I'm glad I did it instead of replacing all the binding because um, going around that headstock especially would have been hard, although I could have probably just done uh, just the neck. <laughs> You'll see I also went around with some thin CA glue and just sort of healed up all the cracks that were there and pre-existing and made sure all the seams and stuff were good so none of that uh, old binding would come off again. You know, it all worked pretty well. So I it felt pretty tight and I was pretty happy with the job. Of course, I had to fit it to the fingerboard because the binding I had was a little tall, um, which was tedious, but you know, that's guitar work. So this label on the back of the headstock started to come off on me while I worked on it. I decided to quickly mod podge it to make sure I didn't lose any more of it, which is great because you can use it as glue and a finish. And the label says um, Atlas Musical Instruments in Hicksville, New York, which is one of the labels that appears on some of the stuff that was uh, you know, made in the Tysco Del Rey factory. I don't know if they were an importer or how that all worked, but that's just one of the names that comes out of there, and you'll see it every once in a while. And they're always pretty decent guitars from what I've seen. Um, so now that I had the, the binding on, it was time to just go through the frets and set them all up, and they were in pretty good shape. I also put a lot of oil on that old dry fingerboard to kind of bring some of that wood back to life. Um, and I just did a basic fret job on it. The truss rod seemed to work and everything, so no big deal. I also made these little badges to put on all of my uh, rehabbed, refurbished work to just sort of add to the lineage. And I didn't have a truss rod cover, so I made that quick one and I put Lawsuit on it instead of Les Paul. <laughs> Let's take a quick minute to talk about this whole lawsuit thing, because technically this is not a lawsuit guitar, uh, but a lot of times they're called that. Uh, and so I don't, like I said, I'm not an expert, but what I do know is that in the 70s, uh, this Japanese guitar factory, which is the Ibanez factory, it's often called the Fujigen factory, they're also making replicas of 
uh, American guitars like the Gibsons and the Fenders and stuff and selling them over here for much less and sometimes even a little bit better because there were some quality control issues at the time in those American factories. Um, and then sometimes they were just horrible. It was real hit or miss, you know, but they were inexpensive and they were a great way for people to get guitars that they wanted to play and play them. And so at some point in time, obviously this upset some of these American businesses, uh, Gibson sued Ibanez over their Les Paul copy. Um, and what they got him on was the shape of the headstock was identical. And I I guess they had that shape trademarked or something so Ibanez had to stop making the headstock like that most of them were not involved in the lawsuit it was just like this one particular thing that Gibson was able to whack them on and make them change their their shape um, of course they just continued to make these things and eventually Ibanez developed its own successful brand and identity on its own too um, and so it's kind of like today there's all these great inexpensive guitars you know coming over from these Chinese companies that you know you see them and you buy them they're good for beginners and sometimes they're a little bit better than the ones that you can get from the big names same thing was happening then just it was japan not china and um i've had a lot of japanese guitars over the years that have been awesome this is one of them now on to the body uh, i was missing some parts and you can see it was pretty gunged up so i you know continued to strip it apart and uh see what i had and what i had to work with and the first thing i noticed was that this um the strap peg someone had dropped his guitar in its butt and and forced that strap peg all the way into the body um, which I was able to pry out, you know, with a pair of pliers and that little ice pick. Um, and uh, so that just means I have to replace some of that wood so I have something sturdy to put a new one into. Um, and then other things that I noticed were, uh, you know, there's some bits of tape here and there. And the finish isn't great, but I didn't, you know, get too crazy on it. I wanted to keep the original finish and look. Um, but here, the I did not have a, a string holder. And these threads were different than, like, all those string holders that I had in stock. Um, so I had to use some, I found some bolts that just happened to fit and they looked okay. So I cut them to fit. And then I started picking through my, uh, pickup collection, to pick a couple humbuckers to use in this guitar. These are all, you know, used and out of other guitars and stuff. So now that I sorted out most of the missing parts, I could start doing the repair work. And, um, it was a pretty simple fix to make that end pin fit good. I just used a, an oversized dowel. I drilled it all out, plugged in the screw holes as well. And then, uh, you know, blended it all to fit with some sandpaper and some, some kind of semi-gloss black paint. Um, that's the great thing about uh, something that's black is it's pretty easy to, <laughs> to match the paint. You have to wire this guitar in a specific order by starting with the wiring harness to the three-way toggle switch that gets buried under the pickups and everything else. And this is just a, a little trick if you didn't know this. You can very quickly and easily twist wires together to make your own harness. Um, and so, you know, I started by doing that. I soldered the switch in, then I put all the electronics in and just copied the standard Les Paul wiring with the dual volume tone knobs. I settled on an old DiMarzio pickup I found and a lace sensor in the neck position out of my pickup collection. That was left over from a, a tone testing video I did years ago. Nice pickup. I don't know if I can really film this, but you see uh, there's no ground wire to the bridge, so it was a little noisy. So I popped out this tailpiece hole and you can see that this is actually like kind of, it's like a gap. There's like an air gap between this arch top and then the solid flat back body um, which I kind of thought I saw when I was putting the pickups in but now you can you can kind of really see them there it's sort of interesting there's like this this gap there I was happy to see by just bolting it back together and putting everything the way it should be uh, it all started to tune up and intonate nicely and uh, I didn't have to worry about shimming the neck or anything like that it was all still in alignment and then I had to make some uh, parts for it you know like a missing cavity cover Usually I do this stuff with a laser, but I had to fit this by hand. It was just easier than trying to create a laser file. So I plugged it in to try it out. But then I noticed this. When both pickups are on, it gets kind of thin sounding. So I think uh, they're out of phase with each other. I mean, why not? They're totally different brands from totally different eras. They sound a little bit jangly, so they're probably out of phase, but I actually have this really cool tool so I can check and find out for sure. So most of the time I make my own pickups, I don't have to worry about stuff like this, but um, I noticed that these didn't sound quite right when they're in, in a position where they're both on. But I have this really cool little tool I got from um, N Audio, and uh, it's a guy, he makes all these little, little guitar testing tools, and this thing is a way of testing polarity, just to make sure, instead of poking around the wiring and, uh, and potentially screwing something up, I just wanna make sure I'm actually doing the right thing. So you can see I plugged my guitar 
into this little unit. And now I'll just take something metal and touch it to the pickup. So I'm going to start by flipping to the neck pickup. And I touch the magnet and I see I get a positive reading. It, sometimes it does that little flash there at the end. And so you just double check. Yep, it's definitely positive. That's the first reading I get. Positive. So then I switch to my bridge pickup. And I get negative. So we know that these are not properly aligned. So the easy solution is to just take one of these and disconnect the wires and flip them to make the positive negative and the negative positive. Doesn't matter which one, unless you have other reasons, like if there's a third pickup involved or something, and we'll put them all back together. So this is uh, nAudio.net, and uh, if you find yourself doing this kind of work, you might enjoy having this around. So I'm going to make my ground, my positive, and my positive, my ground. i got to disconnect it from this little cluster. So now we can check and see that's positive, and that's positive, so they're in phase. Let's go give a listen. ton of fun playing this thing but I'm not really a guitar player and um, you know it just so happens that one of my best friends in the world is a guitar player and he plays a vintage black Les Paul so why don't we bring this thing over and uh, do a little a B comparison so this is your new guitar is it? <laughs> no you don't get to keep it oh uh, yeah man so it's just exactly like yours, right? Well, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> Except for the bull thunder. Except for that, but... <laughs> Probably weighs less. Uh, yeah, you know, I think it might... It's like hollow. There's stuff. actually like a... There's like an air gap between oh, yeah. the top and the and the, the, the flat part. Yeah. Like, I don't I don't know if it's on purpose. No, well, it might be. But uh, Maybe yeah, so that's where all the drugs are. I didn't check. <laughs> but then it was also like, um, because of that, like when I got it, you know, when you the video's done, you'll see it. The end pin, someone had dropped it on the end pin. The end pin was just oh, like, yeah. you know, all the way in there and stuff. Dude, you know, I remember that double neck that I had? Oh, you don't and have it anymore? I, no, I, I sold it because we needed to repair something in there. <laughs> <laughs> Some parts. Yeah. But that was the same thing. It was like in late 70s lawsuit, and it played, it was like better than a Gibson. Like yeah. $400, and you know. So, well, hey, thanks for swearing. And oh. now. <laughs> I didn't know you were getting video, uh, <laughs> audio too. Yeah, I got it apparently. <laughs> but so now we're going to get to see, put it to the test, and we'll see if that lawsuit guitar is better than your real one right over there. Yeah. Well, they're pretty good. It says Atlas Guitar Company on Atlas. the back, okay. but it's it's the lawsuit factory. It's yeah, the, no, the Fuji Gen Ibanez factory, you know. Yeah, they had all their little names <clears> for it. They had a hundred names. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Usable? Oh, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, without question. Yep. I used one for a long time. That double neck. I used to gig with it, I recorded with it. And yeah, that was a similar. Cortez. Yeah. Cortez. Probably around. Uh, probably the same factory. 1980 or so. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, but the, uh, <laughs> it was hard to tell the difference if you didn't know, you know? Cool. Yeah. Let's hear the real thing now. The real thing? <laughs>
I don't know. Yeah. So it's an even trade, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I can take either one. Might be a little wider on that, maybe just a tiny bit. Does yeah, that it could be? And yeah, um, I mean, obviously, there's the bolt-on neck versus yeah, you know, um, and then obviously the aftermarket pickups. But uh, but it really, I mean, it feels like similar. Yeah, it feels like a less ball. Yeah. yeah. Would you would you sue Gibson or would if you were Gibson would you sue? <laughs> I might have, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Especially back then, you know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> cool. So, but here's like, uh, are that's, yeah, about the same, I guess. So, so your Les Paul, what year is that one? 80. It's an 80, okay. Yep. So it's almost exactly the same age as I this know. guitar. <laughs> Obviously it's had an easier life. Yeah, <laughs> than probably. The, than the, the one that got kicked into the back of the closet a hundred <laughs> years ago. But, um, but so the, like, what's the, what's the book value on that right now? Like if you were to sell that Les Paul today, what do you think you could get for it? Um, Here in Connecticut. I don't have the original case, unfortunately. No. All right, well now it's worth nothing. I know, so you know, I may as well just throw it in the garbage. <laughs> um, I don't know, what's a, I haven't looked it up lately, I guess because I have no real plans on selling it. So. Right. Um, I don't know, maybe 35-ish? Yeah. yeah, that's probably, I mean, a, 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 brand, a brand new one is 28 to three, Yeah. you know, of the standard yeah. nowadays. So. Or you could pick up something like this for a few hundred bucks and put some better pickups in it. Or that, I know. Right? I mean, it's like, obviously, there's a, you know, there's something really special about owning a, a vintage Gibson, but I kind of think there's something a little more special about owning, like, these vintage oddballs. Because, know, right? you know, it does it play as good? Maybe not. Maybe you can make it play as good. Is it close enough? Well, yeah, you... You could you could probably get it to play about as good. I mean, I have played ones that have been perfectly set up and you know redone, and mm. and you can't tell if you didn't, weren't looking at it, you couldn't tell the difference. Mm. Um, then there's the whole thing if you drop it, it's not you know the end of the world either. Well, that's you know that's, that's a <laughs> which I have one. done a few times. Yeah, that's a big <laughs> so you get the double the double strap locks on there. <laughs> yeah, yep. Oh my god. Yeah. Cool. We. Um, it's a yeah, once you know Maggie May, you know the, the um, mandolin yeah. part at the end. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was a gig a long time ago, and it was coming to that, and I was about to play it, and all of a sudden I dropped the guitar. <laughs> this one? Yeah. yeah. So you know, I was able to catch it, but still, it was yeah. like so. After that, I got strap locks. Yeah, yeah. Better safe than sorry. Absolutely. It's been knocked off the stand a few times too, so. Yeah, your headstock has, is still original, though. It hasn't been fixed yet, right? So the, yet. you haven't broken the headstock yet. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> well, it's only Tuesday. I know, yeah. 
Hey, thanks so much, Mick, over at the Red Room Sound Studio for playing with me. Um, if you follow me on Instagram and stuff, you'll see I actually made him play a couple different guitars there just so we could kind of hear him in some different hands. Uh, some of them that are available for sale at newperspectivesmusic.com, including this one and also the Japanese imitation Beatle bass that I made a video about last week. They are both for sale over at newperspectivesmusic.com, and if they're not, that means someone got them already. All right, thanks a lot and be good. Uh, all right, man, I'm Jeff. Thanks for your help again. Good to see you. Ah, you too. All right, brother. Yeah, I'll talk to you soon. I got a bunch of text messages. Everybody's been calling me at the same time. So. Yeah, is that who's that over there? I don't know. Get out of here. All right, I gotta go. Bye. Yeah, I'll see you later. <laughs>